Hi, my name is Paulie. I'm an alcoholic. And I want to uh, thank Terry for asking me to speak here. Uh, being a secretary of a speaker meeting is a tough job. It really is. I remember my wife was the uh, secretary over at Brentwood, and God forbid the speaker wasn't on that night. And, uh, but you know what? It's just the way it is. Uh, there's one thing I can promise you that we'll all agree on. I will end on time. I think that's the most important thing for a speaker. Because I know if I'm sitting in a meeting and it's supposed to end at 8.30 and it's 8.31, you're in my time. So I don't hear a thing you say, because now I'm pissed off. So I promise you I will end on time. In between there, I can't promise you anything else. Uh, I always like to hear the traditions read because if it wasn't for the tr third tradition, I wouldn't be here tonight. I came to my first meeting in 1977 and got it in 1993. I don't suggest that. Uh, basically, uh, what it was like, what happened, what, what it's like now. Uh, a Pauly, I'm from back east. Um, just grew up that way. Uh, I came from this typical middle class Jewish family and if any of you from back east, you know what it's like, you know. In my whole life I always heard Jews don't drink, Jews don't drink. But I had an uncle and he drank and he hung out with all the wrong people and he was my hero. He was my, my father used to get up, you know, early in the morning to go to work and come back late. And I go, God, that's horrible. My uncle used to get up when he wanted, he stayed up all night. He was a bookie. I mean, you know, <laughs> that's what he was. You know, and he ran around with those people back east. And uh, I never knew he had a problem, and it was really funny. Because about five years ago, he was 61 years old, and he was in rehab uh, for a little cocaine problem he had. But that's what I was attracted to. That's what I was attracted to. And uh, you know, we do what we do to get there, is the bottom line to it. Some people like beer, some people like hard liquor, some people like Coke. I don't understand that. I used to do Coke and always end up in a closet going, shh. You know, and then as soon as it was over, I'd come out and do it again and run back in and spend a lot of money. It's a crazy drug, crazy drug. And I had the greatest sex in my mind on that drug. That was it. But I found heroin at an early age and I fell in love. That's my story. Uh, for my 16th birthday, I found heroin. And uh, from 16 to 47, I used heroin and narcotics. Uh, I should have known I was in trouble. I was 18 years old and I was already in Sinanon in 1968. And uh, there was a guy named Matt Beard there who played Stymie in our gang. And he took a liking to me. And he said, kid, you better stop now. You can end up like me. And I looked at him like, oh, are you kidding? You know, I'm going to stop when I'm 21. And then I hit 21. Well, I'll stop when I'm 25. Well, I'll stop when I'm 30. I'll stop when I'm 35. And then I gave up. And I said, I totally accepted that way of life. I had no problem with it. Uh, I can adapt to anything. Anything. I've run in this city from Venice to downtown to East LA to South Central, the Watts, all, and I fit in. That's the insane part about it. I'm like a chameleon. I can go anywhere and fit right in. Just like when I came into my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, within a week, I fit in. It's God's will. You know, let go, let God. I had it down. You know, I knew the serenity prayer. I could tell you how to do this, but I wasn't doing a thing. 
I wasn't doing a thing, but I could fit in. I could just slide right in, and everybody thought I had time. You know, I'm going, are you crazy? <laughs> time. So anyways, um, so that's how I ended up in California. I got busted in New York, and uh, I'm not a tough guy, believe me. And it was like, back then I got caught with a $2 bag of heroin, marks on my arm, and they wanted to give me 5 to 10. And I couldn't see changing my name to Peaches and <laughs> getting all involved in that prison life. So I said, how do I get out of this? And they said, well, go to Synanon. And I said, okay. So I had to come to Synanon for 90 days. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist. 90 days is a lot better than five years. <laughs> so that's how I ended up here. And it was really crazy back then. And I always feel comfortable when I, when I see a little gray hair, because you know what I'm talking about. Those days will never come back. It was totally insane. And uh, I had a great time. I had a great time. Uh, unfortunately, I did nothing. All I did was sell drugs. And uh, it was sex, drugs, and rock and roll. That's all it was. And then all of a sudden, everybody started dying and losing this and losing that. And I got older. I'm going, what's going on, you know? And life, life was a coma. That's what it was. It was a coma. My wife describes me as Rip Van Winkle. You know, like, I fixed in 1962 and woke up in 1993, still thinking it was 1962. <laughs> You know, going, wow, this guy died? Really? What's this new music? All that crazy stuff. And uh, that's just what happened. That's just what happened. And, you know, my sponsor talks about it. He goes, when I get loaded, my life is like a pinball machine. And it's so true. I come shooting out. I'm that ball come shooting out, bouncing from bumper to bumper. And then all of a sudden, like, I'm coming straight down. And just as I'm ready to fall in the hole, the flipper throws me back up again. You know, and I end up in a special slot. And I'm going, what am I doing here, you know? Oh, I'm in jail. Oh, oh, my God. I better get out of here. And it pounces me out, and I'm back bouncing around again. That was my life. That was my life. Uh, before this marriage, I've had three other marriages that uh, were all vague, to be honest with you. <laughs> they were very vague. And I've had three children from three different marriages. I have my youngest one left, the other two have died from overdoses. And that's what happens. That's the reality of it. Uh, I've done a lot of work on that. You know, because I never cried about either kid. And I turned my daughter on to using heroin. So I went through a lot of stuff with that. And I've got my youngest son now who's 24, who doesn't have a problem because he drinks. But the equation is he drinks, he gets drunk, he goes to jail. He drinks, he gets <laughs> drunk, and he goes to jail. Now, I gave him three get-out-of-jail cards, so now he doesn't talk to me anymore because I won't get him out of jail. Mom will. So mom's the... But the equation has changed now. It's he drinks, he gets drunk, he fights with cops and goes to jail. But he doesn't have a problem because he says, I don't use heroin. And I went, okay. You know, I'm here when you want to do something when you want to get tired of doing what you're doing. You know, you can't win handcuffed. You can't, you know, and he thinks he can. You know, it's that youth that'll kill you. Youth will kill you. So, uh, <laughs> no children with this wife, no, no. She has a son and they're like best of friends and he's already gone through the phase and I'm more like her son, and my son is more like her. 
first son's a bit, you know, he has a gambling problem. And when I got sober, I went through a whole gambling thing. And uh, I could never figure out, every time I would go to these card clubs, it was like a meeting. I'd sit down on the table and go, hey, Paulie, how you I go, wow, look at all these people in the program playing cards. <laughs> you know? I don't need to go to a meeting. I got a meeting at the table. You know? And that's, that's how I rationalize. I don't have to go to a meeting tonight. I can stay here and play cards and talk program. You know? And then all of a sudden a dealer came in that was on the program. Now we really got a meeting. So it was crazy. But... Uh, What had happened was, in 1977, I used to end up in uh, psych wards, where they used to give me methadone and Thorazine to come off it. And I loved that, believe me, nodding and shuffling. It was, you know, it was, it was enjoyable. And here's, here's the insanity. The highlight of my day was I would talk the real wackos out of their meds and take them and then watch them go crazy for a takedown and that would be the excitement for the day and then we'd get jello. And, but these people came in from H&I and they were allowed to take out the alcoholics and the drug addicts and that was my first introduction to this. And there was a guy there that I believed got loaded like I got loaded. Unfortunately, I, you know, this was okay, but how do you stop? How do you stop? I don't know. I don't know. I couldn't stop. The obsession ruled my life. Literally ruled it. Uh, I started doing long-term treatments. I did nine months at this place in North Hollywood. I walked out the door, made it to the sidewalk, the connection drove by, and I whistled and I was in the back seat, boom, going, I don't want to do this. And I was doing it, because I know what happens. So, <clears throat> all of a sudden, uh, time passes as, as it always does, and uh, my favorite place is on the couch in front of a TV. And if I have a little drool coming out of the corner of my mouth, life couldn't get better, you know? <laughs> That was it for me. So I'm flipping through the channels as I'm always doing. And believe me, my two favorite channels were the Discovery Channel and the Learning Channel. Because I can tell you I've been everywhere and know everything about it and I know how to fix anything. I was an authority, but I never left the couch. That was the problem. So all of a sudden I'm flipping through and it's like, you know those 3 AMers and you go, Oh my God, he says, do you have a drug and alcohol problem? Here's an 800, it doesn't even cost a call, it's an 800 number. <laughs> it's not like I'm busy, so I call it. They go, oh yeah. And the first thing, it's so funny, <laughs> typical treatment, which I didn't know at the time, and I had insurance, and they said to me, do you, first question, do you have a drug and alcohol problem? I said, uh, yeah. Yeah. Do you have insurance? Yeah. Well, we really care about you. <laughs> Little did I know that would be like 34 grand worth of caring for 30 days. We'll even pick you up. That's how much we care about you. So I went in there and the guy that was doing the intake was the guy who took me to that meeting in 1977. And I just went, so I believed him. You know, don't worry, we'll take good... I said, listen, I know much, how much methadone I need, I know how much Thor is... He goes, no, no, we don't do that here. We do clonidine here. I went, clonidine? I never... It's something new. And what's that? <laughs> he says, oh, we'll take good care of you. And they started putting these patches on me, and all of a sudden I started getting sick, and I, my head goes, we got to get out of here. But now I can't talk. It's like this stuff drops your blood pressure and turns you into like a slug. And I'm going, 
and they're laughing at me, and I'm going, fuck you, fuck you. <laughs> but you know what? I got sober for the first time. For the first time, throwing me in a van, taking me to meetings. And you know what? I really wanted, I never felt so good in all my life. And I said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And I started going to meetings and, you know what, I'm driving one night and I'm going to a meeting. And the car just went whoop. And there I was right in front of the house. So me being the person with all the slogans, this is God's will. I'm supposed to go in there and show these people how good I'm doing. I go in and I give them even, you know, a 30-day chip. And I go, here, you can do this. And they went, well, you can do this. And I went, okay. <laughs> and it was off again. And that's what it was like for a lot of years. I bounced in and out and in and out. But it was the kindness and love from the people I received in this program that I've never re received before that kept bringing me back. Believe me, when you go back out there again, those people aren't like you people. All of a sudden, they're not nice people. These are the people that you've gotten loaded with. You know what kind of people they are, but you totally accepted them before. Now you look at them with different eyes. You know, I would get loaded and want to go to a meeting. That's how pathetic I got. And um, I always had 90 days, you know. And you can always tell when somebody's loaded. I mean, please. But everybody went, okay. Okay. Didn't you have 90 days six months ago? No. But now I have 90 days. And for some reason, it was always the people that cared about me I couldn't tell the truth to. I couldn't tell them the truth. Yeah, I'm getting loaded again. You know, and I don't know what happened this time. Uh, I stopped trying to figure things out. You know, it's like, I never fig try to figure out how they brewed beer, how they processed opium into heroin. I never figured that. I want the effect. I don't care where it's from, how it's done. And that's how I am here. I know if I do this, I'll feel good. And that's what I like to do. I like to feel good. And it's just the opposite of all my thinking. I become a giver, not a taker. That's not me. You show me you care and love me, I'm going to tear out your heart. Simple. It's just like when it's time for me to make my amends. It was, I mean, when I got sober this time, I'm going, I'm doing this. You know, but how many times have I said, I'm doing this? I'm sorry. I'll never do that again. I'll never hurt you again. I'll never steal from you again. And as soon as you go, okay, I'm doing it again. So it's not what I say anymore. It's all about what I do. I have yet to tell my mother I'm sorry to her. My father died two years ago. I never told him I was sorry. But I sure acted it. <laughs> Believe me, calling mom and going, is there anything I can do for you? And she says, yes. And you go, oh, shit. Here. But that's what I do. That's what I do today. You know, it's all about what can I do for mom? What can I do for her? And she can drive me nuts. Believe me. She can drive me crazy. So anyway, I get, you know, the hardest thing for me when I got sober the hardest question my sponsor had asked me was, what do you want to do to become a productive member of society? I think that question and how do you feel were the two hardest questions when I was new. I don't, I've never worked at, the first year I filed income tax, the IRS called me and where have you been for 47 years? <laughs> <laughs> and seriously, I looked at this woman, I went, I've been very busy, believe me. <laughs> and I said, I don't have a clue what to do. 
I don't know what to do. Uh, I don't even know what it's like to get up and go to work. I don't have a clue what to do. Um, and he came up with this great idea. He says, well, you got to do something. So uh, he says, you've been in enough treatment centers. Why don't you get a, a drug and alcohol counseling license? And I'm like, okay. And I went to school. Now, I haven't been to school since 1965. This is 1994. And I can't even remember a paragraph. And I'm going, how do you do this? But I've been in enough treatment centers where all of a sudden they're going, and, and I went, I know the answer to that. This is easy. And I did exactly what I do in meetings. I sit in the front, keep my mouth shut, and listen. And all of a sudden, like, I'm getting all these A's. I'm going, whoa, this is pretty cool. And uh, I got that certificate. I started working in the treatment field. And I make it real clear to the people I work with that that's treatment, it's not recovery. You know, they think they come in there, they stay for 30, 60, six months, and they're cured. That's bullshit. If it was that way, we wouldn't send you to meetings, tell you to get a sponsor, and do all the other stuff that I do, so I don't get loaded again. And it's like, the concept is like, unreal at times. I, uh, I'm working in a place right now, and it's real hard in treatment to work in a place that you believe in. Uh, but it's down with the real nitty gritty thing. It's like one of the only places in town that if you uh, have a drug and alcohol problem and you're homeless and broke, they want you. You know, and I came from one of these $28,000 a month places where I'm going, I can't stand it here. And I'm happier than hell working in this place. And uh, I work with a lot of people from day one to 30 days. And then they go on to another level. So I, I see it, bam, right in front of me. And it's so amazing because I see me constantly walking in through that door with day one. No self-esteem, but don't you know who I am? <laughs> you know? <laughs> they all come in, and it's like, yeah, I had this, I had that. Then what are you doing here? You know, if I had all that going on, I wouldn't be here. Believe me, I'd still be out there. And it's just like myself. I had to learn manners. I had to learn respect. I had to learn to communicate. I mean, the basic vocabulary I had was, it's good, it sucks, fuck you, fuck this, fuck that. And that was it. That was my conversation with you. That's all I needed to do. And then all of a sudden I had to start talking. And these people have to start talking. And all of a sudden what's amazing is, that little light goes off and all of a sudden some of them get it and some of them don't and it's such a trip to watch people start progressing and uh, bam they fall I tell them your chances are slim to know when you get here let alone if you don't do anything you know they think they can come in do nothing and there's a lot of work to be done when you first get here. There really is. At least there was for me. I had to work really hard at my sobriety. That's why right now I always tell them, I go, you know what, I've worked too hard for this. I don't want to give this up. This took too long to get. I'm too old to go back out there, believe me. Because uh, I end up downtown LA in the Cecil. That's where I end up, thinking I'm better than the guy that sleeps in the box in the street because I have a room in the Cecil. <laughs> but that's where I end up. That's where I end up all the time. And uh, unfortunately, none of them stay. I've yet to see anyone. I've got one guy with 11 months. 
out of hundreds, literally hundreds. And it's so amazing. For the first two weeks they're there, oh, I'm so grateful, you know, oh, thank you. And they start putting a little weight on and then they go, you want me to mop? <laughs> Whoa, I don't mop. <laughs> Yeah, and then, you know, okay. But I, I see the power of this disease. Cunning, baffling, and powerful. There are people I see that have a lot of time hanging over their heads to go back to prison for a long time, and that does not come into the equation when they get loaded again. I want to get loaded, I don't think. That's what I do. All of a sudden, when that second step kicks in, for the first time in my life, I'm thinking of consequences. I'm going, God, if I get loaded, I'll lose this. I'll end up back downtown again. No, I don't think so. Maybe I should call somebody. Because I find that as soon as I tell on myself, it takes the power out of it. It's the most amazing thing. If I keep it inside, it just eats me away, it eats me away. And I watch these guys constantly. What's up with you? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Day or two, they're gone. Day or two later, the PO is looking for them. Oh, well. Uh, and we forget. I mean, we had a shocker. 27-year-old kid left at 7.30 in the morning, was charged with murder by 3 o'clock, killed a woman in his car, got drunk and killed a woman. For three days, everybody's going, oh, everybody's, you know, I'm calling my sponsor, I'm going out, I'm working this, you know, I'm doing this. All of a sudden, everybody forgot it. it didn't happen anymore. We forget. We forget. That's why I feel real grateful to see this insanity in front of me all the time. My life is real good today. I have no complaints from where I've come from. I've got, I've got dreams and fantasies that have come true. Uh, all by doing everything I've done in this program. Uh, I have, my home group is Roxbury Men's Stag on Wednesday night, and uh, I'm there every Wednesday. And there's a lot of people there in the entertainment business who kept saying to me, oh, with your voice and your look, you can, you know, be in the movies. And I'm like, are you crazy? I can't do that. And that's, you know, I do some of that now, and it's so much fun. I get to play that guy I thought I was, you know? <laughs> and it's a trip, and I do it real well. And they go, God, how long have you been doing this? And I go, a week, <laughs> you know? It's fun. And the thing that gets him is, I, you know, I don't know anything about that business, and I just got into it. I've only been doing it for about three years. And nobody tells the truth. Nobody. Everybody lies. So when I walk in and tell them the truth, they go, really? Really? <laughs> you know? So what have you done? Nothing. Oh, okay. And when I do get hired, I'm nice to people. I thank them, which is like unheard of. You know, you don't thank anybody. You know, you're lucky I'm here. No, no, I thank people. I thank people. You know, it's like... And believe me, I can see where you can get carried away because all of a sudden they make you think you're somebody. And I'm nobody, you know? All I gotta do is get loaded. And it's gone. It's gone, just like that. I've had it happen and I see it all the time. And it always goes when everything is good. Because when things are good, that's when I'm comfortable. When I'm comfortable, I can relax. When I relax, that's when I'm in trouble. Because now I don't have to go to a meeting. If I don't go to one, pfft. believe me, I leave this place and I've got all the right answers. How can I not have the right answer for someone who has under 30 days? I mean, please. 
And I can get in the car and go, you know what, I don't need to go to a meeting tonight. I got the answers. I know how to do this. I'll take tonight off. But I know if I take tonight off, I may take the next day off. And before I know it, I only need a meeting a week. Before I know it, I don't need any meetings. Before I know it, I'm getting my key at the Cecil. That's what happens. That's what happens. This thing is, it is, it just gets me how cunning, baffling, and powerful this thing is. How it just can take you and just twist your brain around. But it only happens to us. That's the common bond we have. I don't know you, you don't know me, but we know each other. Because we've been there and done that. That's the bond that I believe that we have. And the hardest thing is being consistent for me at this. I'm not too consistent. You know, the only thing I was ever consistent at was getting loaded. And I would literally do anything to get loaded. But yet there was always restrictions on staying sober. You want me to do this? Oh, no, no. I'll do this, but I won't do that. You know? And if I'm consistent, I use pe I hang out with a lot of people who have time, and I see what they do, how they are, how they feel. And if I want what they have, I do what they do. It's really simple stuff. It's so simple, that's what makes it really hard for me. Because I'm trying to, my first five years sober, I'm trying to figure this thing out. I mean, don't waste your time, please. It's really a waste of time. I'm going, there's got to be more to it than this. There has to be. And there isn't. There really isn't. All I know is, if I don't go through with the plans that I come up with, before discussing them, <laughs> I can be in real big trouble because uh, even today my plans aren't all that good. They really aren't. And I've always got to talk to somebody about my plans because my plans always want to come around the side door. I don't want to go up straight up ahead. Let me come around the side door, just pop in and pop out again. And I can't do that, those things anymore. All those things I used to do, all of, just my being doesn't work anymore being so. It just doesn't work. Uh, like I say, you know, I have seen in myself and people that are real close to me the absolute change that happens to people when they stay sober. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. I mean, we, if you think about how nuts we are, the stuff that we, you know, you sit in the meeting and all of a sudden, you know, somebody talks about, oh, I was so drunk, I peed on my wife, and everybody laughs. You know, I peed in the, uh, here, I did this, and everybody laughs. Now. You tell my mother that, she doesn't think it's funny. You know, why would you do that? You know, my father used to say to me all the time, why do you keep doing this? And I go, I don't know. I can't stop. I can't stop. He goes, yeah, but you throw your life away. You know, you end up in jail. You overdose. You do this. You do that. But you keep doing it. I don't know. I don't know. And he finds nothing humorous about it. Nothing and I think is pretty funny. That's how crazy I am. You know? But you know what? Today, I don't have to worry about those things anymore. I drive down the street and being unlike other people, I see things people don't see. When I go by a 7-Eleven, I see two, three people guarding a phone booth. I know what they're doing. You know, that don't you dare use this phone attitude. They're waiting for an important call. Um, and I don't do that. I don't have to guard phone booths anymore. Uh,
my life today is something I could have never dreamed of. That's the bottom line to it. I, uh, all that stuff I heard, you know, make a list on what you want and all this stuff, I would have definitely shortchanged myself. Definitely. Uh, I have a, a woman in my wife, my, my wife, my wife today, my life today, <laughs> that, you know, she's my wife. And she's got like 17 years. And I can't believe she put up with me. And uh, she used to tell me, you know what? I know there's a diamond in there. I just wish it would come out. I'd be going, you're crazy, you know? <laughs> Diamond, do you have any? And, you know, that woman put up with a lot of shit for me. And uh, we have a great life today. We have a really good life today. Uh, it's real simple. It's, we're an example of a couple. I mean, I never thought I wouldn't be, <laughs> My idea of an example, I wanted to be like at the Smithsonian, you know, junkie and sit there like this. And that was, that was my idea of being an example. You know, now I'm an example. People go, wow, how do you do your marriage? And you guys seem always happy. And uh, I never hear you guys yell at each other. Uh, I've never swore at my wife. You know, in that real mean, hard way. I've never done that. Uh, I'm afraid of her. <laughs> She's got a gun. <laughs> uh, but I don't know, you know what, life is good. Life is real good today. Uh, I'm trying to think of stuff to say right now, so it's going to be all bullshit. So I want to thank you all for being here for me, and God bless you all. Thank you. Thanks a lot. That was great. Okay, I'd like to thank Steve for Chapter 5, and, yeah, and Jim for the 12 traditions. Are there any secretary's announcements? I almost fell off this thing, man. Hi, everybody. I'm Terry, your alcoholic secretary. Hey, how's everybody doing tonight? All right. Fire it up. I want to thank you all for coming very, very much. And uh, please uh, join me in thanking Paulie for a great talk. Thanks, Paulie. Appreciate it. And how about thanking Cage for leading a great meeting? All right, Cage. Cage also brought the water. Thank you. All right. <laughs> um, I want to also congratulate our chip people. We had some chip people tonight. Um, Michael with 60 days and Marlena with nine months. Okay, let's hear it for them. Congratulations. Uh, no birthdays tonight, but... Um, we have people with commitments that I'd like to. By the way, uh, we are a little short on people with commitments, so if you would like a commitment, kindly see me after the meeting. We have a number of people here doing double and sometimes triple commitments in this meeting. So if you'd like a commitment, if you want to come every week, please see me after the meeting. We'll be most grateful. Thank you. Was that a volunteer over there? <laughs> okay. Um, Mushti was greeting. I was out there greeting. Uh, thank you very much. Tom, David, and Eric uh, did some setup. Thanks, fellas. Appreciate it. Uh, my sponsor, Don, brought some, made the coffee tonight, some great AA coffee. Duncan is away tonight. Karen brought some wonderful refreshments. Thank you, Karen. Appreciate that a lot. Casey brought our birthday cake, and Casey is also our treasurer. Thank you very much, Casey. Um, Kathy does our literature, but she's on a retreat, so if you need any literature, kindly see me in the back after the meeting. And if you're new, please don't leave without a big book, 12 and 12. There's also meeting directories and um, both Los Angeles and the South Bay. Okay, so see me after the meeting back there. Thank you. Let's see, our CSR is done, and uh, tonight our cleanup in the auditorium, Phil does the cleanup in the auditorium. 
So if you'd kindly help him by picking up your chairs, and we're going to put them under the stage up there and taking your cups and throwing them in the, uh, in the kitchen. Thank you so much. And uh, we're going to need help in the kitchen. Mushti is here, and she's going to do the kitchen tonight, but we're going to need probably about two or three more people to help back there, okay? So kindly give us a hand after the meeting cleaning up, and we'll be out of here in no time. Um, are there any newcomers that came in after the meeting began that would like to stand and, and say hello? <laughs> Any new, any new friends would like to say hello to us? No. Okay. And there were no visitors. Any AA-related announcements tonight? Pushti. Okay, yeah, I understand next week there's a woman-to-woman -woman retreat. Okay, so um, this is going to be a men's stag next week. <laughs> no, that's wonderful, but maybe uh, I've got a great speaker. Evan is speaking next week, so please come on back and, uh, and tell a friend. Oh, will you? Thank you so much. Thank you. And you know what? Let's hear it for all our women people, okay? Thank you very much. Okay, so come on back next week and bring a friend. Let's thank Paulie one more time, okay? Thanks, Paulie. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. God bless. Okay, this has been a regular meeting of the Friday Night Play Del Rey group. Please come back next week and bring a friend. If you have any court cards and or papers to be signed, please see the secretary after, after the meeting, or me after the meeting. I would like to close the meeting by reading the promises from the big book of AA fo followed by the Lord's Prayer. The promises. If we are painstaking about this phase of our development, we will be amazed before we are halfway through. We are going to know a new freedom and a new happiness. We will not regret the past nor wish to shut the door on it. We will comprehend the word serenity and we will know peace. No matter how far down the scale we have gone, we will see how our experience can benefit others. That feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear. We will lose interest in, our, in selfish things and gain interest in our fellows. Self-seeking will slip away. Our whole attitude and outlook upon life will change. Fear of people and of economic insecurity will leave us. We will intuitively know how to handle situations which used to baffle us. We will suddenly realize that God is doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. Are these extravagant promises? We think not. They are being fulfilled among us, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. They will always materialize if we work for them. enjoyed this recording. To obtain additional copies, receive a free catalog of AA and Al-Anon talks, or to find out about our tape and CD of the month club, call Encore Audio Archives at 1-800-878-1308 or visit our website at www.12steptapes.com.